talk to you just a minute before I get into our message. You may be aware or, or unaware of things that go on around us. There is a spiritual battle that unfolds around us every day. All of it. Our Heavenly Father and Jesus and the angels are at war with the forces of Satan. The forces of Satan are constantly doing battle, trying to come at us to do whatever they can to destroy us. Satan's job is to steal, kill, and destroy. These things go on in the church as well. This church is growing and going in the name of Jesus Christ, and Satan would love nothing more than to disrupt what God is doing. I want to ask this morning, how many of you pray for our church? And to show, show hands, sort of, it, you don't have to put hands up, so I just want to ask, how many of you pray for our church? How many of you prayed for my wife and I as pastors of this church? How many of you prayed for the deacons or for the elders or for those teaching in different groups? Satan will do anything he can to disrupt the unity and the harmony of this church. And he uses, believe it or not, people to do it. Satan doesn't just show up and say, hey, here I am. No, he uses people, whether they realize it or they don't realize it. Sometimes we end up doing his job. We don't even realize we're doing it because we get unhappy or whatever. And so we have to realize and, and bathe what we say and do in prayer. We have a unity in this body of believers in and we need to preserve this. And to do that, we must have love. I'm not getting on anybody because this is a forewarning. Okay? To do this, it means that we must make sure we talk to each other about what we're doing. And if it means we overstep sometimes then, or we get ahead of God, then we have to take a step back. We must make sure that what we are doing needs to be and should be done for the church at this time. We must communicate with each other. A church can never survive on what it did church only survives on what it is doing and planning, and that through Jesus Christ. We can A church cannot live on what we did last week or last month or a year or 10 or 50 years ago. It doesn't work. This is 2022. We must communicate. Times come that somebody doesn't see something the same way we do, well, we've got to be adults about it, right? We don't get mad. We act like the mature disciple of Christ we're supposed to be. And as I said, we do what? Communicate. What makes a church grow in love, faith, and service? Understanding that we may not always agree, but we can always get along. But that's not what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about something else that's something else is when people don't always agree on. So as I said, we're all going to be adults, so don't get mad at me for throwing right next. I want to talk to you about church membership. We're in a series called the Effective Series. This will be the last one of this. The first week was the Effective 
Christian, which we subtitled The Effective Church. So next week was called The Effective Witness. Last week was The Effective Disciple. And this week is called Effective Church Membership. So let's pray. Father, as we get into your word today, let me be able to communicate the way I need to so we can clearly understand what you have for us. Father, don't let me be in the way. <clears throat> I just thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been a pastor for 22 <clears throat> plus years. I've seen a lot and I've heard a lot. I've seen people who simply refuse to join the church for whatever reason they had. I've seen those who came for a while and didn't join. I've seen those who came for a while and they got saved and joined. And I've seen those who on the first Sunday ran up and joined the church. And that's not usually a good thing because most likely they don't come back. Because they have something confused here about being saved and being a member of the church. And those aren't the same thing. So why is church membership important? Why should we even want to join a church? Why should we want to want our name on a piece of paper saying we're a member of this church or any church? I mean, why waste time even talking about it? Why not just spend our time talking about Jesus? We can spend our time talking about the gospel. Why church membership? Well, I agree. In fact, all Christians should make the gospel the center of their lives. I believe this. We should want to share the gospel with others and see people saved. And, and you know, I had the opportunity to do that just this past week. We had some ladies meeting here at the church, and they gave me a call and said, hey, there's a guy hanging around by the front door looking in. So I come up here, began talking to the guy, not knowing what his motives were. The guy was distraught. So I began talking to him. I began talking about the Lord and where he stood with the Lord. The guy ended up getting saved. Amen. Man, salvation. That's important. We should want our lives to reflect the love of God in the gospel. And as Paul said, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I'm passionate that every Christian display the gospel in their lives. That's also why I'm passionate about church membership. That may seem weird. It may seem odd. Let me, me just tell you this. Church membership was not invented by pastors. It was not invented by ministry leaders or church growth experts. It's been around much longer than that. You see, membership is a natural outcome of the gospel itself. Perhaps you've never <coughs> considered it, but the gospel is not just about how God saves us from the dominion of darkness. It also is a message of how God saves us into the kingdom of His Son that He loves. A kingdom bustling with other redeemed sinners who, like us, are now citizens of heaven. If you're passionate about the gospel, then one of the primary ways to display the gospel to the world is by joining the local church. Let's, let's, let's dig a bit deeper into this, okay? The gospel is a message about how guilty sinners can be reconciled to a holy God through the death and resurrection of Christ. Everybody agree on that? Christians are those who recognize their own moral bankruptcy and repenting of sin turn to Christ for forgiveness. Right? That's how we get saved. Now declared righteous in Christ and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, they now gladly live under the rule of Christ, following His commands and seeking to glorify God. Ultimately, a Christian is someone who has been reconciled to God. But that's not all there is to it. The gospel not only 
reconciles us to God, but also reconciles us to God's people. One reason so many Christians have minimized the importance of church membership is because they reduce the gospel to merely a personal relationship with God and not much else. But the Bible teaches something quite different. Sinners are hostile not only to God, but to those who bear His image. If you haven't figured that out, just watch the news for a while. Why do you think they want to shut Christians up? Why do you think they want to pass laws that you can't talk to somebody about Christ? Because they are hostile not only to God, but those who bear His image. Our broken relationship with God creates broken relationship with others. The Bible regularly portrays this reality. In fact, you remember in the Bible, one of the first stories after Adam and Eve take their big fall and God ushers them out of the Garden of Eden? Remember the first stories about Cain and Abel? Is the first murder in history. Cain and Abel, they were brothers. They were at odds. One was a herdsman. One was a gardener. That's cool. You need both, right? So what caused their big rift that caused the death? Well, they both brought offerings to God. And the Bible says that Cain brought the firstborn and the best of his flock and herd and sacrificed that to God, but Abel brought some of his produce. And God said, that's not acceptable. I want the first and the best. He gets mad. He kills his brother. Remember that? And God says, hey, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? That's where that comes from, by the way. <laughs> I know you probably heard it and maybe even said it. Am I my brother's keeper? Your mom slapped him at that time. <laughs> yes, you are. That's where it comes from. Am I my brother's keeper? The first murder recorded in history. Let me tell you, sinners want to show God off of his throne and put themselves on it. And Cain shows that we're not about to let some other human take it from us. Not a chance. Adam's act of breaking fellowship with God resulted in an immediate break in fellowship among all human beings. It's every man for himself. You've heard that too, right? So the gospel restores our relationship with God. It also restores fellowship between us and other redeemed sinners. When we abandon our hostility, to, to our hostility towards God, we also abandon our hostility for one another. In other words, Christians are those who now delight in the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What does the gospel produce in us? Love for God and love for his people. Being reconciled to God then means being reconciled to everyone else who is reconciled to God. Ephesians chapter 2 the first half of Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul talks about salvation. I didn't have this mark because this morning I was redoing my sermon before church. So but it's, 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 it's one of those. So the first half of chapter 2, Paul's talking about salvation that Christ has provided for his people. In the second half of chapter 2, Paul talks about the, about the gospel and how it restores fellowship between those who are in Christ. So Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has brought
broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And then in verse 19 it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The gospel gives us a personal relationship with God. But according to scripture, that relationship with God includes meaningful relationships with his people. When we come to Christ, he... He folds us into his family. A family that actually, well, it's flesh and blood. It's a family that's a step on your toes type people because that's what family does, right? Church membership, therefore, is the natural outgrowth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we receive God's mercy, we become a part of a People, when we receive God's grace, we are included in a covenant community. Reconciled to God, reconciled to his people. Charles, Spur Charles Spur Spurgeon said, I believe that every Christian ought to be joined to some visible church. That is his plain duty. According to the script, according to the scriptures. God's people are not dogs, else they might go about one by one. They are sheep, therefore they should be in flocks. So what distinguishes members from regular attenders? Is it a vote? Is that all there is to it? Is there clear biblical reason for the importance of membership in the local church? Why is it better to be a member than simply somebody who regularly attends? Especially if membership entails further obligation. What does it mean to be a member of this church? What is it that potential members are asked to commit themselves to? I'm asking all kinds of questions. You're supposed to have the answers. How are members asked to live out that commitment in particular ways? Before we think about what church membership should mean, I'm going to go a different direction. It would be wise to ask a more basic question. What is it that I join when I join the local church in membership? What is the church? Let's first answer something else. What is the church not? The church is not a loose affiliation of people who hold roughly the same religious beliefs, no matter what those beliefs might be. We don't join a religious club, we join a church. The church is not a building. A building is simply a place to meet. We're not going to an exclusive clubhouse when we go to church. The church is not a non-profit organization with a clear vision statement and lucid objectives. We're not joining some humanitarian society when we join a church. The church is a regular assembly of people who profess and give evidence that they have been saved by God's grace alone, for his glory alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The church is a local, living loving collection of people who are committed to Christ and committed to each other. The church is a display of God's wisdom and glory. Ephesians 3.10 says, So that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. The church is a display of counterculture. Christ-like love. John 13, 35, by this often will know that we are his disciples. How? If we have love for one another. I've got six reasons real quick I'm going to share with you. 
about church membership. Number one, visible commitment to Christ and his people. Membership is one way we raise the flag of faith, right? When we get saved, we have the public profession of faith. Now, one way we do a public profession of faith, we come forward to the church and know, hey, I got saved. Number two is baptism, right? Let me tell you, another public profession of faith is to join a church. We're letting the world know, I am part of this church. This is my church, right? So membership is one way to raise your flag of faith. You state before God and others that you are part of this body of believers. It's easy to talk about being part of the church with a big C. That's the church universal. The invisible church, the body of all believers near and far. Living and dead, but it's the visible church where, where, where God expects us to live out our faith. It is in church. Real fellowship, let me tell you something, is hard work. Why? Because most people are like us. Now, you may be perfect, but I'm not. Most people are selfish and petty and proud. And so, that just filters in. But when you're a church body, you love and forgive and continue on. And you learn from each other. Let me tell you, that's the body that God calls us to. Is the local body. The Christian community is where Christians are supposed to live out their lives, their Christian life, where we're supposed to do life together. You know, Paul wrote a lot of letters, very few to individuals, and those were mostly to pastors. Right? We can see in the book of, well, several different books about the body of the church, the local body of believers. Paul, if you're in the book of Acts, you see over and over and over where he is going somewhere, and that local church gathers around him. They're there. They're with him. That is a local body of believers who, guess what? They're all members of that congregation. They knew the importance of it. In the book of Acts, when the church was organized, they had growing pains. The first time they elected deacons to help serve. And as you continue reading the book of Acts, as I said, you find churches and people affiliated with those churches in different places. Places. Number two, commitment. It makes a powerful statement. You know, bowling leagues and lodges and other places, they have membership requirements. Sadly, some of those have more membership requirements than some churches do. Our culture today is a consumer mentality. We like going to convenience stores. It's convenient. It's a consumer mentality. We want instant mashed potatoes, right? We just want to go somewhere and buy the whole meal, take home, and say, look what I cooked. We have a consumer mentality. Joining a church, well, it's a countercultural statement. It says, I'm committed to this group of people and they are committed to me. I'm here to give more than get. Even if someone in town for just a few years, they're just here for a short time, it's always good to join a church. Why? Because it tells your home church, hey, I'm plugged in. I'm plugged in. I'm being taken care of. It's not just about being taken care of. That's a good part of it. It's about making a decision, sticking with it. Something in our society, with our over-oppressive number of choices, it's hard to do. We prefer to, to date the church, right? We just want to date the church, not commit to it. We just want to date that church. Want to have her around for special events and 
take her out when life feels lonely or keep her around for a rainy day. Membership is one way to stop dating. Church is actually very one. Tom Rainer has a book says, I'm a, church I'm a church member, and he wrote the book. It says, all too often, too many of our church members in the U.S. have an unbiblical view of church membership. Their view is more aligned with the country club mem mem membership. For them, membership is about receiving instead of giving, about <coughs> being served instead of ser serving rights instead of responsibilities, entitlements instead of sac sacrifices. This wrongful view of membership sees the tithes and offerings as membership dues that entitle the member to a never-ending list of, priv of privileges and expectations instead of a wrongful or in instead of an unconditional cheerful gift to God. We need to be committed to God, to Jesus, is church universal to the local church? Number three, I'm independent. Good old U.S. of A., the best and the worst. We're free spirits. We're critical thinkers. We get an idea, we run with it. But who's running with us? Our are any of us running in the same direction? Membership states in a formal way, I am part of something bigger than myself. I am not just one of many individuals. I am part of the body. Number four, church membership keeps us accountable. When we join a church, we're offering ourselves to one another to be encouraged, rebuked, corrected, and served. We're placing ourselves under leaders and submitting to their authority. Hebrews 13 said, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of, the, of their way of life and imitate their faith. We are saying, I am here to stay. I want to help you grow in godliness. Will you help me do the same? That's what church membership is about. Mark Deeper in his book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church writes, Church membership is our opportunity to grasp hold of each other in responsibility and love. By identifying ourselves in a particular church, we let the pastors and other members of that local church know that we intend to be committed in, attend in attendance, giving, prayer, and service. We allow fellow believers to have, a, have great expectations of us in these areas. And we make it known that we are the responsibility of this local church. We assure the church of our commitment to Christ and serving with them. And we call on their commitment to serve and encourage as well. Get to my points as quick as I can. Number five, being a faithful shepherd. Hebrews 13, 7, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. That's your part as lay people. Here's our part as leaders. We keep watch over you as those who we give an account. As a pastor, I, I, I take very seriously my responsibility before God to watch over and care for souls. This is hard to do. We don't know who is really a part of the flock. One example of thing, one of the things I like to do is when somebody misses, I send them a text, hey, I missed you in church today. But if they're not a member of the church, I don't know if they just missed this week or if they went somewhere else. So I send text and get nothing. So I don't know, are they still <coughs> part of us or not? If somebody's a member, well, kind of give me permission to hound you a little bit more. And tell you how much I love you and how much I miss you. Right? It's nearly impossible to shepherd the flock when you don't know who really considers me to be their shepherd. Number six, last one. Promises made, promises kept. When somebody joins a, a church, become a member of Central Christian Church, they make promises to pray, give, serve, attend. 
attend worship, <coughs> accept the spiritual guidance of the church, obey its teachings, and seek the things that make for unity, purity, and peace. We ought not to make these promises lightly. They are solemn vows. And we must hold each other to them. When you join a church, we make, we make promises also. We promise as a church to pray for you and your, fam and, and your family to be there in times of, Christ, of crisis, to stand with you and not leave you alone when you, when you need help or there to help care for you. And that may mean sometimes as simple as bringing meals when you're sick or sitting in the ER or being at the funeral home with you. Teaching you and your family biblical truths, God's word, showing love as only a family can do. To not join the church is to miss an opportunity. An opportunity to publicly make these promises, inviting the elders and the rest of the body to hold you to these promises, which would be missing out on a great spiritual benefit. For you, your leaders, the whole church, as well as missing out on, on well, on what the local body of believers can mean to you and do in your life. The church is meant to do what? As I said before, do life together. Regardless of how messy that may be sometimes, membership matters more than most people think. Now I want to say this. Church membership is for believers only. It is not for those who simply give intellectual approval of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That gets the church in trouble down the road. It is for those whose lives give evidence and increasing application of the principles of the gospel in the situations of everyday life, whose character increasingly reflects the holiness of God. We are not to judge others, but we are to be fruit inspectors. Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. That's why it's important for us to talk to them and come join the church. About what? Their salvation experience. Guess what? It is okay to question somebody's salvation. Tell me how you got saved. Except as long enough as so they can tell me their salvation experience, I can tell you if it's really theirs or not. If they really got saved, they know it. And if they didn't, then they don't know it. Guess what? It's okay. It's okay to say, are you saved? Yeah. Tell me about it. When did you come to Christ? How did you get saved? For one, I like to hear the story. It's a wonderful story so they're telling you their salvation experience. It's a wonderful thing to listen to. But as a church, it's very important it just it is not good for the church to have members who don't know Jesus. And then later on, if that person becomes in a leadership position, they're still not saved, what happens? You see, we can't say, well, let join the church, maybe they'll get saved. That's like saying, well, Mary, maybe they'll learn to love you. So why is church membership important? It's important because you are. Church membership is important because you are important. It's important because the church is important. We're going to be doing a new members class soon. We're getting everything together for that. It's a class that I want all new members to take and all those wanting to know more information about the church. 
Don't you think it's time we stop dating the church and said, I do? Let's pray. Father, this may be a difficult message for some of us to hear. But, Father, it's important for all of us to hear. Father, because we need to be reminded of our responsibilities as a church. We need to be reminded of, our, of what we're supposed to do. But, Father, we also should be reminded as individuals. And, Father, it's good for those who are thinking of joining the church, know a little bit more about it. Father, let this let this serve us in a way that we can learn. Father, let us serve you. Remind us of how important it is to be part of the local body. Thank you for this in Jesus.